imagine a fence so long you can see its impact from space. A barrier slicing across deserts, farms, and entire ecosystems. It's not a border wall. It's not a defensive line. It's the dingo fence of Australia. Built to keep predators out, it ended up dividing the continent into two completely different worlds. Today, we're mapping out the line in Australia that changed everything. From rabbits to rain clouds, let's map it out. It all started with one man's hobby. In 1859, Thomas Austin, a wealthy settler in Victoria, released 24 wild rabbits for hunting. He figured they'd make good sport. Instead, he created an ecological nightmare. It was supposed to be a weekend amusement. It turned out to be the world's fastest invasion. With mild winters and endless grasslands, Australia was basically a rabbit's paradise. Within decades, there were hundreds of millions of them. They stripped hills bare, destroyed farms, and caused massive soil erosion. By the 1890s, entire landscapes looked like moving carpets of fur. Imagine looking across the outback and seeing the ground move. Not wind, not waves, but rabbits. Chewing their way across the continent. And the government panicked, offering 25,000 pounds to anyone who could stop the plague. The solution? Build a fence big enough to keep the rabbits out. It was part engineering project, part desperation act. From 1901 to 1907, workers in the brutal outback heat built the rabbit-proof fence. 1,833 kilometers of wire netting stretching from north to south. They used 350 camels, 210 horses, and 41 donkeys to haul materials through the desert. That's roughly the distance from Amsterdam to Rome, if you walk the whole way carrying barbed wire and a hammer. And when they finally finished in 1907, the rabbits were already on the other side. By 1902, they'd been spotted west of the fence line. The unstoppable barrier failed before it even opened. Australia had built a wall to stop nature, and I think this image sums up just how ridiculous the idea was. So they built a second fence, and then a third. By the time they were done, Western Australia had over 3,200 kilometers of rabbit fencing. None of it worked. The rabbit plague wouldn't truly ease until the 1950s, when scientists introduced a disease, a disease that killed millions of rabbits. And the fence remained, now used to control emus and wild dogs, repurposed as the state barrier fence instead. But Australia had discovered an even bigger problem. Its apex predator was eating the sheep. So cue the sequel, because if one fence fails, obviously the next step is to build a longer one. Welcome to the dingo fence. Australia's native wild dog was devastating flocks across the inland plains. So the government decided, let's build a long fence. Because apparently the lessons from the first ecological disaster was, let's try a bigger version. The dingo barrier fence finished in the 1950s, linked up with older fences into a single continuous wall, 5,614 kilometers long, stretching from Queensland all the way to the cliffs of the Great Australian Bight. That's longer than from New York to Los Angeles, with distance to spare. And the fence doesn't separate two countries either. It separates sheep from everything that wants to eat them. And this wasn't a new idea either. It was an escalation. Back in the 1880s, settlers had already built thousands of kilometers of dog-proof fencing to protect individual farms. By 1930, Queensland alone had over 32,000 kilometers of scattered dog netting, crisscrossing the outback. The 1950s project connected all these isolated barriers into one continuous line, turning individual and regional protection into a continental wall. It's the world's longest fence. And to this day, it's patrolled by maintenance officers who drive hundreds of kilometers a week to fix gaps, clear sand drifts, and to get rid of dogs. Entire jobs exist just to keep this artificial border alive. The fence isn't just a barrier, though. It's a kill zone. In South Australia, there's a 40,000 square kilometer buffer zone called the Dingo Sink, regularly treated with poison. 40,000 square kilometers, an area bigger than Switzerland, dedicated entirely to making sure one species never sets its paws inside. The result is a continent split into two ecological realities, one with dingoes and one without. Well, fewer at least. The odd thing is, the invisible line didn't just divide land. It divided life and nature itself. 
Scientists call it the world's largest unintentional experiment, a trophic cascade at continental scale. In other words, remove one predator and the whole food chain starts rewriting itself. Think of it as Australia's biggest oops, a 5,000 kilometer science experiment no one meant to run, still collecting data 70 years later. On the inside, where dingoes are excluded, nature behaves differently. Without dingoes to hunt them, kangaroo populations increase rapidly. A four-year study counted animals on both sides, at least in a certain section. The dingo side had 85 dingoes and just eight kangaroos. The opposite side? One lone dingo and 3,200 kangaroos. That's not a healthy ecosystem. That's kangaroo explosion. Imagine a landscape where the grass never grows above ankle height because 3,200 hungry jumpers just got there. It's less wild Australia and more post-apocalyptic petting zoo. The overgrazing stripped vegetation so severely that researchers found lower levels of phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon in the soil, the very nutrients plants need to grow. A 32-year satellite study using NASA Landsat imagery confirmed what you can literally see from space. The dingo site is greener, with denser vegetation. They've also created these small fence plots to exclude kangaroos in the dingo-free zone. They became islands of grass in an otherwise bare desert within five years. That's how intense the grazing pressure is. Outside the fence, ecosystems are healthier, balanced by dingo's role as the apex predator. Inside, it's ecological collapse in slow motion. It's like watching a country run two versions of nature at once. One balanced, one slowly eating itself alive, and all because of a line humans drew across the dirt. To understand why this matters, you need to know something about Australia. It's the world's leader in mammal extinction, which, by the way, is not a title anyone was competing for. Since European settlement in 1788, at least 38 native mammal species have gone extinct. That's more than any other continent on Earth, and it's not slowing down. Over 100 species are either critically endangered, endangered, or vulnerable. Nearly one in three of Australia's unique mammals is at risk of extinction. The main culprit? Invasive species. Cats and foxes, which were introduced by European settlers, have driven 22 native mammals to extinction across Central Australia alone. Feral cats kill an estimated 2 billion animals in Australia every year. So with the dingo fence, you remove one predator, get two new ones, kind of like nature's version of a hydra. And this matters because 87% of Australians' mammals exist nowhere else on Earth. When Australia loses a species, the world sadly loses it forever. And the fences? They're making it worse. Because every barrier that Australia builds blocks migration routes these animals need to survive. Each new fence cuts off another chance of survival. The same walls we built to protect nature are quietly strangling it. Let's take the emus, for example. These six-foot-tall flightless birds migrate hundreds of kilometers every year. They follow seasonal rains in search of food and water. But the fence cuts right through their migration route. Imagine running a marathon every year and someone puts a steel wall across the course halfway through. That's life for an emu. When 20,000 emus tried to migrate through farmland during the Great Depression, the Australian solution was military intervention. In November of 1932, they deployed two veterans armed with machine guns. Their mission? Eliminate the emu threat. After six days and about 2,500 rounds of ammunition, they killed maybe 50 birds. Maybe 200? Reports vary. The emu scattered, regrouped, and kept moving. The soldiers eventually gave up. It jokingly became known as the Great Emu War, and it's the only war where Australia lost to birds. Eventually, a bounty system worked much better. 57,000 emus were killed in just six months in 1934. And the rabbit fences? They became part of the solution by blocking emu migration routes. They also became part of the problem. Today, during droughts, thousands of emus congregate at the fence line unable to continue their migration. They end up dying in stampedes from exhaustion and dehydration, or have to be shot to prevent suffering and fence damage. The fences block their natural movement patterns, and emus are vital seed dispersers for Australians' vegetation. 
Trapping them on one side means plants lose genetic diversity across the continent. Remember those 350 camels used to build the rabbit-proof fence? Well, they became a pest problem too. Camels were imported earlier to help explore Australia's interior. They were perfect for the job. Tough, drought-resistant, and capable of going weeks without water. But when motor vehicles took over, thousands of working camels were released into the outback. Today, Australia has over 1 million feral camels, the largest wild camel population on Earth. During droughts, they smash through fences looking for water, causing millions of dollars in damage. Wildlife managers have tried to control the numbers for decades, but camels can double their population every 8 to 10 years. So the animal that helped build the fence to stop one pest became pests themselves. So we've talked about some animals in Australia and how they deal with fences, but what about kangaroos? Kangaroos can jump over it and push through weaker sides of the fence. When they break through the dingo side, they find better grazing and escape their overpopulated zone. When they break through farmland, they devastate crops. So the solution to this was upgrading fence sections to wild dog standard, which were stronger and taller. It works. Kangaroo breaches drop dramatically. But it also means those kangaroos stay trapped inside the dingo-free zone, where their population expand and destroy the landscape. A repeated trend, that the fence upgrade solves one problem, but creates another. It's the ecological version of a whack-a-mole. Fix one hole, three new ones appear, each with fur. And in a country where species are already disappearing faster than anywhere else on Earth, blocking movements of these animals might not be the best solution. In fact, the fences may even alter where it rains. So to me, this may be the craziest part of the fence story. The fences actually may be changing the weather. So you built a wall to stop the rabbits, and a century later, you're accidentally changing where clouds form. The rabbit-proof fence in Western Australia marks a stark boundary, native brush on one side and cleared farmland on the other. In 2007, researchers flew along the fence line and photographed something remarkable. Clouds were forming over the dark native vegetation, but clear skies over the farmland. So the science behind it is the native vegetation is darker and absorbs more solar radiation. That heat rises, creating the conditions needed for clouds. The lighter colored farmland reflects more sunlight back into space, staying cooler and putting less heat into the atmosphere. Fewer clouds, less rain. Dr. Ray Looning, who studied the phenomenon, put it bluntly, if you keep clearing land, you eventually reach a point of diminished returns. You're actually reducing your own rainfall. Translation, the more land you clear for farming, the less it wants to cooperate. And it shows how one decision, clearing land at a continental scale, can literally change where it rains. Today, the fences still stand, but their purpose is changing. They've gone from frontier defenses to stubborn monuments, and yet they've become a stage for conservation debates. Do we keep dividing nature to save it, or reconnect what we've broken? Maintaining them costs millions each year. That's a lot of money to babysit a fence that mostly confuses emus and hurts ecosystems. Some ecologists argue the fence should be moved or dismantled entirely to help restore the ecosystem. Others argue it's just too valuable for the livestock and sheep industries. These lines are more than just lines on a map, though. They're silver scars visible from space, dividing environments, wildlife, and even clouds. And that's what keeps me curious about these fences. Not the length or the engineering, but what it says about us. We keep trying to outsmart nature building walls and fences, and not thinking about the impact it may have. So what do you think about the fences? Are they worth the consequences, or would a different approach be a better option? Thanks so much for watching. Your support means the world. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and let me know in the comments what you thought. See you next time, where we'll map out something new.